people are okay with that. Uh, our speaker, Hansen, uh, said it was okay. So uh, I'm Bill Mosley and I'm uh, in the geography department and I'm director of the Food, Agriculture and Society program, uh, which is an interdisciplinary six course minor. So if you're a Mac student and not familiar with that and you have those interests, by all means, uh, please reach out and uh, contact me to learn more. Um, this is part of the Enviro Thursday uh, seminar series. So I wanna thank uh, the Environmental Studies Department for being uh, a co-sponsor. Other co-sponsors include the Geography Department, uh, the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, um, the Concentration in International Development and the Concentration in African Studies. So this is very much uh, a, a group effort. Um, so it's uh, my great honor and privilege uh, to be able to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Hansen Yantaki Frimpong, who is an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Geography and Environment uh, at the University of Denver in Colorado. And I've um, known Hansen for many years now. Um, I was actually really fortunate to be a member of the jury for his uh, PhD dissertation. And then I've been following his work uh, very closely over the years. Uh, he earned his PhD from the University of Western Ontario in uh, Canada. And his advisor was Rachel Besner Kerr, who's now at Cornell, but is also a big name in, in sort of agriculture and the African context. Uh, he teaches about in the areas of political ecology, rural development, the human dim dimensions of global change, sustainable agriculture, and food systems. And his work has been funded by the National uh, Science Foundation. He's very well published. He's had articles appear in Global Environmental Change, Applied Geography, Ecology and Society, Geoforum, Health and Place, the Journal of Peasant Studies, uh, land use policy, professional geographer, uh, among other journals. And just in the last few days, he was awarded the um, AAG, the American Association of Geographers Africa Specialty Group Award for uh, Emerging Distinguished Scholars. So that's a huge uh, feather in his cap. Um, so, uh, Hansen, uh, I wish you could be on our campus, um, but uh, given the situation with COVID, uh, uh, virtual is better than nothing. So uh, please welcome Dr. Hansen, everyone. Hansen Yantaki Frimpong. Thank you for being here. All right. Thank you very much, Bill. And I thanks for the invitation. And I thank all of you for joining the Zoom this afternoon. It's, it's still morning here in Denver. So. Uh, let me share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Okay, good. Okay, so what I want to do today is to talk about um, something that climate scholars call maladaptation, particularly in the context of sub Saharan Africa, and more specifically in northern Ghana. Uh, this is the outline of what, what I'll talk about. First of all, I will describe what climate scholars refer to as maladaptation and its various types. Then I will talk more about a research contest, especially the creation of a group that uh, is called the surplus people. And then I'll talk more about intra-household gender relations because these have a huge role to play in terms of some of the results I want to share. And then I'll talk briefly about my research methods. I don't have a lot of time, but if you have questions about the methods, I can discuss them in depth during the Q&A session. And then I'll share some results and then draw a couple of conclusions. And I think I can do all these within 30 or 35 minutes and you, we can leave the rest of the time for questions and answers. Feel free to stop me at any, any point if you want any clarification, but uh, hopefully I can get through this and then we can leave the, the last 25 minutes for Q&A. So let me start with the IPCC report and perhaps everybody on the Zoom here knows what the IPCC is, is the international body that assesses climate change impact and adaptation. And over the past couple of years, they've been writing reports. Uh, I think every five years, they are now working on the seeds assessment report 
The fifth one, which in short is called AR5 or the, the fifth assessment report was published in 2014. And just about two years ago, they also published what uh, they call the 1.5 special, 1.5 degree Celsius special report. Now there are a number of conclusions from this report, but what, what I want to do is to flag one that is particularly linked to the concept called mal adaptation. So according to the IPCC, especially the report that came out in 2014, and then the one that came out last two years, uh, the IPCC talks a lot about the need to encourage climate change adaptation. There is no doubt that our climate is changing and the, the IPCC encourages all governments, entities, NGOs, colleagues, you know, and, and uh, professional bodies to encourage climate change adaptation as a way of managing the risks that come with our changing environment. But the report also concludes that uh, there is something we call maladaptation and most, more specifically, not every climate change adaptation is a good one or yields positive results. That is, in other words, there are some forms of adaptation that actually deepen vulnerability. And the, the proper term for that is what the IPCC or climate scholars call maladaptation. The definition I have here is the IPCC's own definition of what is meant by climate adaptation. That is, any efforts or any, any measure that seeks to moderate or avoid harm or exploit beneficial opportunities. But there are countless of case studies showing that not every adaptation measure fulfills these particular uh, elements that is highlighted in the IPPC's definition of adaptation. There are some adaptations that do not moderate harm or that actually intensifies climate change vulnerability. And that is what we refer to as maladaptation. The concept of maladaptation started emerging in the IPCC reports about seven years ago. And over the, the past five years, there's been a lot of case studies trying to look at how this form of maladaptiveness come about and how to resolve it. So for example, an influential paper was published by Siri Eriksson, who is based in Norway, and reviewing some of the initial publications on climate change and uh, some of the measures that could be classified as maladaptive. And this paper has been well cited. It, 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 it talks about some of the practices in different parts of the world that are, or that could be classified as maladaptive. Another influential paper was written by Lisa Shepard, who is the editor for the Journal of Climate and Development. And this came out, I think, last year. And again, it talks about the fact that adaptation measures normally go wrong. It's not all adaptation measures that yield positive outcomes. And aside from these two influential papers, there's been countless case studies on, on maladaptation. But what all these papers show is that you can classify maladaptation into three different forms. There is a first form that is called rebounding vulnerability. That is when an adaptation measure intensifies the vulnerability for the person implementing that particular measure. So the impact is on the actor, the person who is implementing a particular adaptation strategy. That is the first type of maladaptiveness. The second one is called shifting vulnerability when the impact of an adaptation measure is shifted onto someone else or an external actor that is not the person implementing the, the, that particular adaptation strategy. And then the third part is what climate scholars call eroding sustainable development when an adaptation strategy, for example, intensifies greenhouse gas emissions, which will end up intensifying climate change. So with all the adaptation, maladaptation measures that we have, you can classify them under one of these three broad categories, rebounding vulnerability, where the imp impact or the effect is on the person implementing that adaptation strategy, shifting vulnerability when the effect is shifted onto someone else, maybe within the same community in another state, for example, in the US here, or maybe internationally. And then the last one is when an adaptation measure pollutes the environment or when it leads to more greenhouse gas emissions. Now the IPCC FIFA assessment report went on to show that we need to do more research, especially more empirical case studies on what causes these forms of maladaptation, how to resolve them. And most importantly, the third point here is my focus this afternoon to better understand why a group of individuals will implement an adaptation measure that is apparently negative. So if I'm implementing an adaptation measure to adapt to drought or flood, and I know the long-term negative consequences, why would I still do that? The IPCC is calling for more research on some of these maladaptive outcomes. And what I want to, to do this afternoon is to, is to tell a story around how a group of farmers in Northern Ghana know that an adaptation measure is actually negative or has negative consequences, but they still go ahead and implement 
those measures. And overall, I want to make two main arguments. One is that maladaptation comes about or it becomes necessary when people have limited viable options to choose from. And in the case study that I want to share today, you will see that it comes about because of being landless or what Karl Marx calls being surplus people. That is what is causing maladaptiveness in the context of Northwestern Ghana. And then also, I also want to argue that the complex intersection of two identities, in this case, class, and then gender and culture can complicate the causes of maladaptation. And I'll show you that when I get to the resource session. So these are the two main arguments I want to make this afternoon based on the case study from Ghana. Okay, let me describe the research context uh, a little bit for, for, for people who don't know the geography of West Africa or the, the, the West African Sahel region. So this case study is coming from Ghana's Upper West region, the far Northwestern province. It's close to Burkina Faso. This is the, the, the region where I've been doing work for the past 10 years. And this is Burkina Faso. It shares borders with Burkina Faso. Uh, the, the Ghana government officially calls the region as the Upper West region. Uh, this is one of the poorest part of the country. It's, it's, if, you pick, if you pick every development indicator, the Upper West will rank lower when it comes to Ghana. So poverty, for example, is more than 70% of the population. Food insecurity is 54%. Infant mortality is 70%. In other words, if you give birth to 10 kids, Chances are that seven of them will not survive. Maternal mortality rate is 50%. So if you have a group of, let's say 10 women going to the hospital to give, to give birth, about half will not come back. They will die through childbirth. So it has a whole complicated set of uh, poor development indicators. It is also 98% rural. So apart from the regional capital, which is WA, it is 98% rural and heavily agrarian. So most of the structures would look like this if you drive through the region. It has a savanna, dry vegetation, incredibly dry. And uh, we've done a lot of analysis using long-term climate data to assess climate change in the region. And we've seen that over the years, rainfall amount is reducing drastically. And then also there's a lot of rain intensive rainfall events. So for example, uh, based on rainfall, rainfall records from 1953 to 2011, we've seen that the rainy season has gotten increasingly shorter. Now it's be between, the, it rains only two to three months in a year, but 10, 15 years ago, the region used to experience rainfall for six or seven months. I've had older research participants told me that there are some years that they never experienced any rainfall, for the whole 12 months. So it's getting increasingly drier and drier. And, and I can talk more about this later in the Q&A session if, if you want. Now, on top of the dryness, in more recent years, the region is also experiencing a lot of heavy rainfall events and flooding. So within the two to three months period that it rains, it's so intensive that it leads to flooding. It floods all villages, it floods farms. And this is a photo here showing a, life, a group of livestock being washed away due to the, the floods that occurred just last year. So it's, 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 it's experiencing both floods and, and droughts at the same time. Because of the poor nature of the region, the government has been trying to look for alternative ways of developing the region. And about 10 years ago, an Australian mining company came in and did gold exploration and saw gold mineral deposits in some part of the region, which I'll show you in, in, in just a second. Uh, that company is called Azuma Resources. It's based in Melbourne, Australia. And it negotiated with the government to have access to the, to the land so that it can mine gold over a long term. And the government, the Ghanaian government agreed on the assumption that when you have a poor region like this and you have a large gold mining project coming in, it can create more jobs. It can reduce poverty. We already know that poverty is 70% of the other people. So if you have a large mining company coming in, that can help to reduce poverty. It can also modernize the region through the provision of mining infrastructure like roads, schools, and hospitals. So the government quickly bought in into the idea of giving the, the, the gold deposits to the Australian mining company for, for, for mining. 
So the, 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 the company went through all the legal processes to get the land with this mineral, gold mineral deposit. Uh, so this is the Upper West region, the map I showed you earlier on, and all the red spots here are places with gold deposits. And all these small dots are villages or communities. So as, I, as you can see, the deposits are right on the border with Burkina Faso and also in this part of the, of the region. So what the government's overall, the land area with the gold deposit is around 316,000 hectares or 781,000 acres, if you do the, the, the conversion. So the Australian company negotiated and got a concession over these lands, especially the, the areas with heavy gold deposits, this part here, and then this region here. And the concession was for a period of 99 years to do mineral exploration and also for subsequent gold mining. As I mentioned earlier on, the company went through all the legal processes to get the land. And they also did environmental and social impact assessment of the mining projects. But overall, uh, so when, they got, when the company got the land, it enclosed it with fence and security officials. And what that did was to did, dispossess smallholder farmers who used to use this mining lands for food production. And there are estimates showing that about 3,000 smallholder farmers were affected because of these enclosures for mining. Now, when this happened, most of the men in the villages where the, the mining enclosure occurred decided to leave the communities for labor work in cities in the southern part of the country, especially the Accra, the capital, and also in Kumasi. And uh, most of the women decided to stay behind to look after, after children and also to take care of livestock. So if you drive into a typical village, all that you see is just women. You won't see, you would see only a few adult men who are older or frail, but for the able-bodied men, most of them have migrated to look for jobs elsewhere, just because they've been rendered landless because of this gold mining project. Okay. Now, the, the 300,000 people who have lost their, their lands, you know, their, their agreement was that because they've lost their lands, they, they could be employed for, for mining exploration, but that never happened because first of all, they did not have the skills that the mining company wanted. So most of them were made landless, but their labor power was also not absorbed into mining extraction. And this is a typical example of what Karl Marx in his book, Capital Volume One explains or shows us surplus people, people whose land is needed, but their labor is not, or their labor has been made surplus to the requirements of capital. So in a sense, you have 3000 surplus people in this poorer part of Ghana. Uh, let me say a few words about intra-household relations in the Upper West because that has a huge role to play in terms of some of the findings I want to share. So the Upper West region is inhabited by a group of ethnic, an ethnic group called the Dagabes. And they are a heavily patriarchal group. Men dominate in almost all facets of household relations in terms of decision-making, making decisions on, on what to plant, how to use household incomes, and so it's heavily, heavily patriarchal. And on top of that, there is also a marked gender division of labor at a household level. So, so for example, when it's time for farming, a man would have to clear the land, but it is a woman's responsibility to plant the crops, harvest the crops, dry them, and then store them in the granary. So there's a marked gender division of labor. And also in terms of food security, there's also a marked division of labor in terms of food provisioning. So normally men will have to provide the main ingredients for, for preparing the household meal. And then the women would have to provide what we call the soup ingredients. And I'll show you that in the next slide. And on top of that, we also have something we call non-pooling households. So these are non-pooling households, households where men and women work and retain their own income. So there is nothing like income sharing. And you have men who don't know how much their wives earn, and you have women who also don't know how much their husbands earn. They are called non-pooling households. And all these have complex implications for food security and climate adaptation, as I will show later on. So in terms of food provisioning, for example, as I said earlier on, for, for the main meal, uh, let me show you this slide. So if you have a typical meal like this, which is made of corn with soup or a sauce, the corn is normally provided by men. 
but it is the woman's responsibility to look for additional ingredients to provide the soup and then uh, the, the fish or the protein that will come with the, the main meal. So maybe as a husband, all that I need to do is to just provide a, bas a basket of corn or millets. As to how, as a woman, you will prepare the meal and add a sauce to it, that is not my business. You need to look for your own soup ingredients and prepare the meal. Now, it is this provision of soup ingredients that is forcing women surplus farmers to look for alternative places of farming, even though they, they've been rendered surplus by the mining project. Because as surplus women, they still need to provide what locally is called soup ingredients, that is getting vegetables, fish, salt, and things like that, that will come with a main meal. So you have to find a way of doing that, even though you become landless because of the mining. And then also women also have to still find ways and means of fulfilling the agenda subjectivity that is being a good wife or a good mother. Because if you're a woman and you are unable to provide soup ingredients after your husband has given you the main meal, then you are not regarded as a good wife. And your kids will not regard you as a good mother. So women have to struggle and find ways, of, ways and means of fulfilling these gendered subjectivities of being classified as a good wife or a good mother. And that pushes them to, uh, look for alternative places to farm, even though they've been rendered landless by this mining enclosure. So in order to, to get the soup ingredients and also to fulfill these gender subjectivities, most of the women have decided to farm along the flat plains of the Black Volta River. So this is the Black Volta River, and it is the main boundary between Ghana and Burkina Faso. If you drive across the border, is the, the, the river forms the main boundary and it has a huge flood plain, which previously was not farmed, but because these women have been rendered landless, most of them are now being compelled to farm on these flood plains. Uh, and I'm assuming not everybody here is a fiscal geographer, so this is an outline of what a flood plain looks like. So when you have a flood, it comes with, with soil deposits and that gets deposited along the sides of the river over time. And you know, the portion here can be very fertile because of the deposits over time. And the flood, when, when the flood recedes, you will also see natural levees being created along the river. Now, what these women in Northern Ghana have been doing is that they have, they have been trying to create additional artificial levees on top of the natural one so that they can extend the floodplain and get more agricultural land for farming. And they do that by using sandbags, sometimes by using household waste, some, sometimes using sticks and all sort of local materials in order to increase the length of the natural levee and also to push the, the, the river further inward so that they can create more land for more vegetable pro provision. And the main rationale for doing this is for the women to get soup ingredients so that they can fulfill their gendered subjectivities. So these are images that I took during field work in some of the floodplains. So as you can see here, we have a sandbag that a woman has been, has been using to block part of the river in the in the in part of the floodplain. Uh, this is another land that is being prepared for vegetable cultivation. So I can see it's it's very wet and as soon as it floods, this is also an artificial levee created by the woman using sand. And when the river overflows, it breaks these levees and then the water runs through communities all the time. And this is another photo of a land being prepared for vegetable production in the flood plains of the Black Volta River. And as you can see here, this is also an artificial levee built with mud. So this woman hired a group of men to raise this levee so that she can cultivate vegetables in here. But when it rains and the flood waters are heavy normally, it breaks these levees and then all the crops are destroyed. And this is a photo of some of the vegetables being cultivated by the women. Another photo of a vegetable field, a typical vegetable, vegetable field in the flood plains. Okay, so briefly, I have two slides about research method. I started doing work in this area in 2012 as part of my PhD research, and I've been going back to these villages over time, over the past eight years. Every summer I go there with the exception of last year because of COVID but I've been going there consistently for the past eight years, speaking with the same farmers in the same villages over time. In 2012, I did 60 in-depth interviews with 
women who were in this village, some of the villages where the mining enclosure occurred, and none of them was farming in the floodplain. Apart from the interviews, I also lived in the communities for eight months for ethnographic fieldwork, and I never saw anybody using the floodplains for farming. Just because at that time, most of them had land, or that is the time that the mining enclosure had started. So its impact were not dramatic. But over time, when I went back in, I've published some of these results in land use policy and in general Pearson studies, the 2012 case study. So if you are interested, uh, maybe Bill can share this with you, or if you send me an email, I can share this with you. But as you see here in 2012, most of the concerns around the land enclosure was male out migration and its impact on food security. So there was nothing on maladaptation, there was nothing on intensive flooding or things like that. But when I went back in 2017, five years later, almost all the women in the villages were using their floodplains for vegetable production, which was striking to me because when I lived in the communities for eight months, nobody was using the floodplain because they knew that it's very risky to farm in the plains or in the, in the river valleys. But five years down the line, because of the stress that comes with getting soup ingredients and fulfilling gender subjectivities, most of these women decided to look for alternative ways of farming vegetables. And the only way they could tend to was a floodplain. So in 2017, I did in-depth interviews with 55 women who were farming in these floodplains. And the results I want to share with you today come from these 55 interviews. And I coded the data by hand for recurring themes. Again, I can talk more about the research methods during the Q&A session. But let me show, show, share with you three, sorry, two types of results from the in-depth interview. The first one is the motivation behind why the farmers or why these women try to farm in the flood plains. And, and here I'm just going to use verbatim quotes because there is no better way of presenting these results than, than to share the stories of the people I spoke with. So this is coming from one participant called Joyce, who is a 33 year old woman and she's describing the main motivation why women use the flat lanes for agriculture, even though they know that when the flood water comes, it's going to wash away their crops. So he says that I know the flood water can wash all my crops away, but I still need to farm here in the valley. All my land is taken, but I still need to provide soup ingredients. I need to be a good mother and wife. So here, this woman is describing what I described earlier on as fulfilling gendered subjectivities of being a good wife. Because if you can't provide soup ingredients, you are going to be classified as a lazy or a poor wife. So these women are being compelled to, or they are being motivated to farm in the flood, flood plains because of the pressure to be good mothers and good wives. But as you can see here, they know that farming in the flood plain could be maladaptive, but they still have to do it because of the pressures that come with providing soup ingredients. So it's not that they are not aware that using the flood plain for agriculture is maladaptive, but they are being compelled to do that because of complex gender relations at the household level. This is another interview quotation from a woman called Becky, 41 years old. And she says that they, referring to the mining company, took the land and gave us no jobs. We can no longer call ourselves farmers. We've been made useless. And again, I highlighted this referring to what Karl Marx referred to as surplus people. The women themselves are classifying themselves as being useless. But a useless woman will still need to provide for her household. And that's why we turn to farming the valleys. So again, they are being pushed to farm in the valleys because they themselves see that they've been rendered useless because of the mining enclosures, but still they need to be good wives. They need to provide soup ingredients for, for household food security. And that is what motivates them to farm in the floodplains. And this is the last quote on motivation. And it's again coming from uh, uh, Becky again. He said that the, the landless men are migrating to cities. So what this woman is showing is the options that become available to men and women once the enclosure occurred. For most men, they were able to migrate to cities, but for most women, they were compared to live in, back in the villages and take care of kids and children. But as Becky continues to show to provide more food as responsible women, women are creating their own lands in the river valley. And by creating their own lands, that is when they create the artificial valleys or at artificial levees so that they can extend the floodplain and cultivate vegetables for food security. 
that is on motivations, but let's look at how these farming practices or farming in the floodplains constitute maladaptation. And I'm going to show you results linked to all the three types of maladaptation. I have a bunch of quotations, but I don't have time to walk through all of them, but I have quotations linked to each of the three types of maladaptation. The first one is evidence linked to rebounding vulnerability. So this is a soil scientist I interviewed. He, he works in the region, he's been there for almost 35 years and he goes to these villages all the time. And this is what he's saying, it's called Ben. He said, whenever the artificial levees break, the floods destroy all the crops. We have found that the force of the floods also wash, washes fields and remove the nutrient rich sediments deposited previously. This challenges women's ability to use the valley the next year. So, so here, when the women create the artificial levees and then they break, it doesn't only break or destroy the crops that are cultivated that year, but it also washes away the, the rich nutrients deposited previously, which makes the, the valleys unproductive the following year. So this is a very good example of what climate scholars refer to as rebounding vulnerability. The impact is on the women themselves, not on an external actor. So the women are engaging in an adaptation practice which end up harming them down the road in, in, in subsequent years. This is another quotation linked to the second part of maladaptation called shifting vulnerability. And this is from a woman participant called Grace, 38 years. She said that the artificial barriers, and they don't use the word levees. Normally, they, in the local term, they'll use barriers. The artificial barriers increase the flow of floodwaters, making the river flow downstream more quickly and pushing water into villages and farms elsewhere. So once the women create the artificial levees, it increases the force of the, of the of the river flow in the Blackwater River. And what that does is that it affects not only the communities where the enclosure occurred, but also those communities downstream. Sometimes it affects farms, it affects households, and it affects other communities that are far away from where the mining enclosure occurred. And this is a very good example of when an adaptation measure has negative implications for an external actor, somebody who is not implementing that particular measure. And then the last one is on eroding sustainable development. And this again is coming from Ben, who is a soil scientist. And he's saying that some of the women create small gullies to drain floodwaters quickly. So in order to, to allow the floodwaters to move quickly, the women create small gullies. But when they do so, large quantities of fertilizer and pesticide residues are introduced into the Black Volta River. And we all know that when you have fertilizer and pesticide residues being washed into rivers, it can cause pollution and also it has consequences of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a very good example of what climate scholars call eroding sustainable developments. That is when you have an adaptation measure that ends up causing more greenhouse gases or polluting the environment or degrading common pool resources. So as you can see from the three quotes I've shared with you, we have traces of all three types of maladaptation occurring in this particular context in Ghana. So let me go back to the IPCC slide, IPCC slide I showed you, the, the call for more work on what causes maladaptation, more work on how to avoid maladaptation, and also more work on understanding why a group of individuals would implement a measure that is still maladaptive. And as I've shown here in, in this particular case, I want to argue that it is the limited availability of viable options that compel these women to, to farm the floodplain because if they were not rendered surplus or not made landless, there is no way they could have farmed in the floodplains even though they knew that it's very risky to use these fields for agriculture. And another point here is women's, the pressure for women to fulfill their gender subjectivities of being good wives and good mothers. That often also pushes them to look for alternative ways of farming with maladaptive consequences. So in short, we see here the complex interactions of class. In this case, all the farmers are landless. Culture, the local culture of a woman being responsible for providing soup ingredients and intra-household gender relations coming together to cause maladaptation in this particular case in Ghana. So that's all I have. I think I've used almost 40 minutes. I want to leave the rest of the 20 minutes for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hanson. That was a great talk. Um, why don't you stop sharing your slides so that we can see everyone and 
open this up. Um, so um, I think what we'll do here in terms of Q&A is if um, people could uh, raise uh, virtual hands and then I'll call you in the order that I see people's hands and I'll just ask a question to get us started and sort of warmed up. Um, Hanson, I'm wondering if there were any sort of protests about, you know, amongst local people when this land concession was originally being negotiated, if there was any pushback. And relatedly, you know, why wasn't it a government stipulation that they hire local people uh, if they knew that they were going to be losing land. Thank you. Okay. So there was a lot of pushback uh, in, in the 2012 case study. Most of the study participants, and I also observed this myself, you know, so there, were, there, there were points where when I started asking questions about land, our, our vehicle was smashed and we have to leave the village for, for complex reasons. So the villagers, most of the villagers, pushback in terms of giving their lands to, to the government. But all the negotiations occurred with government officials and village elders. So in most cases, you'll be there, you wake up one morning and you will see no, no trespassing on your own property. You don't have access to it. But the, the villagers fought and fought, but by the time they realized almost all the negotiations have been completed between government officials and village elders. And most of the people who are the grassroots never had like there, 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 there was no, no other alternative means for them to contest again, because at that, time, at that point, all the deals has been signed and they couldn't push back any further. If you look at, I've had access to the environmental and social impact assessment, and there was a regulation that if there is a job available, the village the affected villages should be given preference. But almost all the jobs, they were looking for geologists, they were looking for GIS experts, they were looking for uh, uh, truck drivers and only a few villagers had those expertise, especially looking for geologists, people with remote sensing expertise, uh, people who are soil scientists. Only, only a few villagers could fulfill those job requirements. And so they ended up, out of the records I saw in all the communities that were affected, only five people got employment in the mining uh, company. And most of them were laborers or they were security personnel in terms of um, as aspects like being a geologist or soil scientist or remote sensing specialist, none of the villagers qualified for those jobs. So there were government regulations, but the people, the local people did not have the expertise to fulfill those job requirements. 